in the 12th century. Amidst the backdrop of the Crusades and the chaos in the Levant, there existed a mastermind whose love for chess was so immense that he breathed life into it, transforming its wooden pieces into living strategies and kingdoms. His world was not limited to the 64 squares of the chessboard, but encompassed the vast landscapes of the Middle East. Known for his strategic acumen, justice, religious tolerance, and mercy, he was respected even by his adversaries. Welcome to Rapid Rewinds, where today we bring you the remarkable tale of none other than Salah Odin Ayyubi, known to history as Saladin. In the bustling city of Tigrid, nestled within the heart of Iraq, the year 1137 witnessed the birth of a child named Yusuf ibn Ayyub, but the world would come to know him as Saladin. Born into a Kurdish lineage celebrated for its bravery and martial skill, he was the son of Ayyub and the nephew of Shirku, both esteemed warriors in the service of Imad Uddin Zangi, who governed northern Syria during those turbulent times. In the ancient city of Damascus, young Saladin found himself immersed in the complex world of warfare and the subtle art of leadership. Observing and learning from his father and uncle, he absorbed lessons that would later define his extraordinary path. A pivotal moment came when Saladin, emerging as a formidable warrior, joined an army led by his uncle Shirku. This army was not just any force, it was the pride of Zangi's son and heir, Nur al-Din. Their mission was critical a military expedition that would take them to the heart of Egypt. It was here, in this ancient land of pharaohs and pyramids, that Saladin began to carve out his destiny, rising from a mere soldier to a master of the battlefield and a leader of nations. The year 1169 marked a turning point in Saladin's life and the broader history of the Middle East. The passing of his uncle Shirku ignited a series of transformative events, catapulting Saladin into a realm of unprecedented power and duty. Acknowledged for his exceptional leadership and military prowess, he was selected to fill the void left by Shirku, taking the reins of Nur al-Din's formidable forces in Egypt, a land characterized by its ever-changing dynamics of power. Before delving into the remarkable ascent of Saladin, it's essential to understand the backdrop of the Levant region, a crossroads of civilizations, cultures, and conflicts. The Levant, stretching from the eastern Mediterranean shores to the deserts of Arabia, has been a melting pot of various empires and peoples throughout history. By the time of Saladin, this region had witnessed the rise and fall of great powers like the Egyptians, Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, Greeks, and Romans. In the midst of this historical mosaic, Saladin's political rise was marked by his appointment as the vizier of the declining Fatimid Caliphate, which still controlled Egypt. The Fatimid Caliphate, an Ismaili Shia caliphate that had once been a dominant force in the Islamic world, was in its twilight years, weakened by internal strife and external pressures. Egypt was a prized land, rich in resources and with a strategic position that controlled key trade routes. Saladin's governance of Egypt was not just about ruling a region, it was about navigating a labyrinth of political intrigue, religious divisions, and military challenges, both from the Crusader states in the Levant and rival Muslim factions. His goal was clear, to re-establish a Sunni regime, a move that would not only alter the religious dynamics of Egypt, but also reshape the geopolitical contours of the Near East. This period was also characterized by the Crusades, where European powers sought to gain control of the Holy Land, adding to the region's complexity and turmoil. Following the death of the last Fatimid Caliph in 1171, Saladin ascended to a significant position of power, becoming the governor of Egypt. This role presented both considerable challenges and opportunities. His strategic prowess was matched by his diplomatic skill, as seen in his marriage to Nur Uddin's widow, Ismet, a union that merged dynasties and consolidated power. His military campaigns saw the capture of key cities like Damascus, Aleppo, and Mosul. His forces stretched their influence to Yemen, consolidating control over the entire Red Sea, a significant achievement in the medieval world. His ambitions extended beyond mere land acquisition. He envisioned transforming his regime into a powerful military entity, robust enough to confront the Crusader states of the West, which had emerged following the First Crusade.
In 1171, Saladin played a pivotal role in reshaping the Middle Eastern political landscape. With the death of the last Fatimid Caliph, Al added, Saladin seized the moment to abolish the Shia Fatimid Caliphate. He proclaimed Egypt's allegiance to the Sunni Abbasid Caliphate, thereby realigning the religious and political affiliations of the region. This bold move not only consolidated his power in Egypt, but also marked the birth of the Ayyubid dynasty. The year 1174 marked another strategic victory for Saladin. With the death of his former mentor and the powerful Zinjid ruler, Nur Yudin, Saladin swiftly claimed Damascus. His entry into the city was unopposed, a testament to his growing influence and reputation. Damascus, a jewel of the Islamic world, now under Saladin's control, became a crucial base for his future campaigns. Over the following two years, Saladin embarked on a mission to unify Syria under his rule. He captured key cities like Homs and Hama, but Aleppo, a stronghold of Nur Yudin's heirs, resisted his authority. These campaigns were not just military conquests but also diplomatic maneuvers, as Saladin skillfully negotiated with local rulers and tribal leaders to extend his influence. In 1177, Saladin faced a significant setback. At the Battle of Montgasard, he was surprisingly defeated by King Baldwin IV of Jerusalem. This defeat was a stark reminder of the resilience and military prowess of the Crusader states. It temporarily halted Saladin's momentum and forced him to reassess his strategies in the region. Between 1182 and 1183, Saladin turned his attention to the Jazeera region, an area of strategic importance between Syria and Mesopotamia. He successfully extended his control over Mosul and further consolidated his power in Syria. These conquests were crucial, as they not only expanded his territory but also secured important trade routes and resources. Saladin's charisma garnered him widespread support across the Muslim world. He proclaimed himself the leader of a jihad, a holy war, dedicated to defending Islam against the encroaching forces of Christianity. This was not just a call to arms, it was a rallying cry for unity under a common cause. By 1186, Saladin's vision had materialized. Through a masterful blend of diplomacy and military force, he united the Muslim territories of Syria, northern Mesopotamia, Palestine, and Egypt. But Saladin was more than a conqueror. He was a patron of culture, a lover of poetry and gardens, a ruler who understood the power of perception. He employed official biographers to record his feats, ensuring his legacy as a generous and noble leader would endure through the ages. The late 12th century witnessed the peak of a long-standing conflict, a saga of battles that had been simmering for nearly a decade. Saladin, Having engaged in numerous confrontations with the Franks, the name given to the Crusaders from Western Europe, was preparing for a decisive move. The year 1187 marked the dawn of a significant chapter in his military campaign. From south of Damascus, he mustered an army, a formidable force drawn from across his realm. Meanwhile, an impressive Egyptian fleet was being readied at Alexandria, signaling the onset of a full-scale attack. The stage was set for a confrontation that would echo through history. Saladin's army met the Franks in a monumental clash at Hattin, near Tiberias. The battle, fought on July 4, 1187, ended in a resounding victory for Saladin. This triumph was not isolated. It catalyzed a series of rapid victories across the Kingdom of Jerusalem, culminating in the capture of the city on October 2, 1187. Saladin, Initially planning revenge for the slaughter of Muslims in 1099, chose a path of mercy, allowing Christians in Jerusalem to purchase their freedom. In the wake of Hattin, Saladin's forces continued their campaign, capturing key cities from the Crusaders. Acre, Tiberias, Caesarea, Nazareth, and Jaffa fell into his hands, each victory further consolidating his control. However, one fortress eluded his grasp, Tyre. This coastal stronghold became the refuge for the surviving crusaders, a reminder that even in the face of overwhelming victories, some bastions of resistance remained. The year was 1187. The crusader kingdom of Jerusalem, a bastion of Christian power in the Holy Land, faced a formidable challenge from a rising Muslim power. Saladin, the Sultan of Egypt and Syria, 
renowned for his military prowess and diplomatic skill, set his sights on Jerusalem. His objective was clear, to reclaim the holy city for Islam. As summer turned to autumn, Saladin's forces, estimated at around 20,000, marched towards Jerusalem. They were a formidable force, experienced and battle-hardened. Jerusalem, under the leadership of Balian of Ibelin, braced for the siege. The city's defenders numbered between 8,000 to 9,000, a mix of knights, soldiers, and civilians. They were vastly outnumbered but determined to defend their city. The siege began on September 20, 1187. Saladin's army encircled the city, cutting off all hope of reinforcement. The defenders prepared for a grueling siege. Saladin's tactics were relentless. His siege engines bombarded the city walls with stones, while archers rained arrows over the defenders. The city's walls trembled under the onslaught. Despite the desperate situation, the defenders of Jerusalem put up a fierce resistance. They repelled assaults and repaired breaches in the walls, fighting with the knowledge that the fate of their city hung in the balance. By September 26, a significant breach was made. Balian of Ibelin, realizing the dire situation, opened negotiations with Saladin. The fate of Jerusalem's inhabitants was now at stake. Saladin, respecting the bravery of the defenders and mindful of his own reputation for chivalry, offered generous terms. Christians were allowed to leave the city safely in exchange for a ransom, a gesture of mercy that contrasted sharply with the Crusaders' own capture of Jerusalem nearly a century earlier. On October 2, 1187, Jerusalem surrendered. The city, sacred to Jews, Christians, and Muslims alike, fell into Saladin's hands. His victory was not just a military triumph, but also a symbolic one, resonating across the Christian and Muslim worlds. The tides of history shifted once again in the aftermath of Saladin's momentous capture of Jerusalem. This significant event reverberated across continents, reaching the ears of Pope Gregory III. In response, he called for a new crusade, a clarion call to recapture the holy city. Thus, in 1189, the stage was set for the Third Crusade, a chapter marked by the mobilization of Christian forces at Tyre, a strategic stronghold that had resisted Saladin's conquest. This new crusade was not just another military expedition, it was led by a triumvirate of Europe's most powerful and revered leaders, Frederick I. Barbarossa, the German King and Holy Roman Emperor, King Philip II of France, and Richard I, the Lionheart of England, each brought their might and resolve to this holy war. The Crusaders, determined and well-equipped, laid siege to Acre, a pivotal city in Saladin's empire. The siege, long and arduous, culminated in 1191 with the capture of Acre and a significant portion of Saladin's navy. This victory, however, was not the beginning of the end for Saladin. Despite the military prowess of the Crusader forces, he withstood their onslaught with remarkable resilience, managing to retain control over the majority of his empire. The culmination of this intense period of conflict came with a truce, one that would have seemed unimaginable years before. In late 1192, Saladin and Richard the Lionheart, two of history's most iconic adversaries, reached an agreement, bringing the Third Crusade to an end. But fate had its own designs. Just a few months later, in March 1193, Saladin, the sultan who had spent his life in near-continuous military campaigns, passed away. He died in the tranquility of his beloved gardens in Damascus, at the relatively young age of 55 or 56. His life, marked by battles and conquests, had taken its toll. In a final act of generosity, Saladin had given away much of his personal wealth to his subjects, leaving barely enough to cover the expenses of his own burial. Though Saladin's death marked the end of an era, his legacy endured. The coalition of Muslim states he had so skillfully assembled began to unravel, yet his descendants in the Ayyubid dynasty continued to rule in Egypt and Syria for generations. Saladin's life and death left an indelible mark on history, a tale of power, generosity, and the unyielding spirit of a leader. This is Rapid Rewind signing off. Remember, Legends never fade, they just get retold. Stay tuned for the next one.